Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Malkin Fund, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America and Ruta Finn. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. And when today's guest was here some years back, I noted even then that there is something almost blessed, something surely wonderfully comforting about almost anything akin to permanence in our ever more rapidly changing universe, about, if you will, standing the test of time. Indeed, I often permit myself the luxury of thinking just that about The Open Mind, which itself, let alone its host, is now quite so long in the tooth. And surely Eli Evans must allow himself to quell more than just a little that his wonderfully evocative memoir, The Provincials, A Personal History of Jews in the South, has aged so well over more than three decades now as to have become a veritable American classic, even as the University of North Carolina Press expands and publishes it again in 2005 to mark the 350th year of Jews coming to America. Now, when asked what makes his book so relevant to today's world, my guest has written, Jews are different and have always been the other in almost every country they have lived in. In the South, they stand apart from the overwhelming religious presence that dominates Southern culture. In a 21st century American political environment where religious beliefs, values, and practices define the cultural divide between sections of the country, the experience of growing up Jewish in the Bible Belt can offer important insights into the soul of the South. And so, in turn, I want to ask Eli Evans whether since he first wrote The Provincials those many years ago, standing apart, as he calls it, from the overwhelming religious presence that dominates Southern culture has become perhaps an even greater burden for the other. Well, I have to say, when I was writing this book in the late 60s, um, I, you know, I traveled 7,000 miles across the South, interviewing not, members, not just members of the Jewish community, but also non-Jews as well, because I had this theory that people, Jews, uh, are, are shaped by the ethos they grew up in, and the ethos of small-town Jews or medium-sized Jews, and now everyone uh, is uh, one of an overwhelming Christian presence. But I would have never dreamed, uh, really, that 30 years later that the uh, politics of all this, the assertion of all this, the television impact of televangelism and so forth uh, would have taken things to the point that it now is. Ironically, uh, it's also a very good time for Jews to be living in the South. How so? Well, it has to do with the passing of a certain kind of uh, uh, Christian extremism that's represented by the Klan. They don't burn crosses in people's yards anymore. There's not the kind of intimidation uh, and church bombings and synagogue bombings that one sensed and experienced in, in the 60s and in those days when I was traveling. Um, uh, things have changed profoundly that way. Secondly, uh, there has always been in the South, uh, Dick, a kind of uh, what I like to call reverence for Jews, a kind of uh, feeling about Jews as biblical people. It's one of the great ironies of growing up Jewish there. It's one of the things that I wrote uh, extensively about in my book because I believe that Jews grow up with, an ex uh, with a, a very special uh, Southern Jewish consciousness. Uh, and part of that is an awareness of this idea. Let me give you a couple of examples. My father, as you know, was mayor of Durham for 12 years, Durham, North Carolina, where I grew up. And uh, uh, when he ran, uh, he put on his poster, 
President Bethel Synagogue, 10 years. Uh, President State Campaign, United Jewish Appeal, 10 years. Uh, Chairman Bonds for Israel, 10 years. And years later, when I interviewed him for this, uh, for this book, I was, I was blessed in a way that my grandmother had left a diary of the immigrant experience uh, in the South. And I interviewed my parents and told my own story, alternating with the story of Jews in the South, which is the pattern uh, of the book and possibly the key to its longevity. Uh, I asked my dad uh, why it is he did that. Af after all, uh, his name was Evans and he could have passed. Uh, but uh, he said to me something very profound. He said, first of all, I didn't want to pass. If they were going to vote for me, I wanted them to know that I was Jewish uh, right away. But he said, and the other side of it was that people down here respect church work. That idea resonates through Southern Jewish history. Item, uh, 1858, something like that in Little Rock, Jewish community is beginning to blossom there, uh, pre-Civil War. The Jews are arriving and don't quite know, they never encountered anything like uh, the uh, provincialism of uh, Christian churches at that time, didn't know what to do, and soon realized that everyone was asking the same question, what church do you belong to? And so they began their synagogue right away. They set up a congregation and started. It wasn't that way everywhere, but it's just such an interesting story that uh, leapt out at me as I did my research. Um, uh, secondly, uh, my grandfather had a little store uh, in eastern North Carolina, and my grandmother writes about farmers bringing their children into the store to be blessed, as she put it, in the original Hebrew. Uh, they also uh, came, uh, another man uh, I, I remember uh, that I talked to, um, had, order, had, had uh, given a sharecropper items from his store. You know, typically the pattern for Jews in the South was you arrived as an immigrant, as my grandfather did, you peddled, uh, you made a little money enough to buy a horse, you made a little money enough to buy a wagon, and pretty soon the farmers started coming to town and you then opened stores. I always tell people that uh, uh, the story of Jews in the South are the stories of fathers who built uh, build businesses for their sons who did not want them. Including that, you and your brother. That's absolutely true, and uh, that paradigm really is, is universal. Uh, Jews in the South wanted to, have, uh, to, to, to give their children roots. Uh, in, the, in the North, you know, it was my son the doctor, my son the lawyer, and, and washerwomen, and people taking in washing and uh, doing uh, labor work in buildings and cleaning up buildings and so forth to send their kids to college. That was the whole idea, to send your kids to the university. That was also the case in the South, but it was a different motive, and it was to give people roots. There's a long story behind this, but I don't want to diverse from the question that you uh, asked. Well, the, the, the further question, or to, to push that further, is that I do understand, because 30 years ago I read The Provincials, and I do understand the role that identification with an ancient religion right. played the positive role and the story of people coming to your father and asking him questions or your grandfather and asking right, right, questions right. Uh, about ancient Hebrew rites right. uh, loom very important for those very religious people but today uh, that's why I raised the question. Well, you know, I, I, just to, as an aside, uh, my grandfather actually told me a story of, of farmers coming in to ask him, what was the percentage of alcohol in the wine? I thought uh, that was so lovely. <laughs> what was the percentage of alcohol in the wine uh, that Jesus drank at the Last Supper? Eighteen percent? He said eighteen and a half percent. And they stormed out of the <laughs> store to do battle with the temperance ladies that awaited them uh, outside. Uh, you know, this is uh, interesting because, in a way, things haven't changed quite that much. I uh, was interviewed on CNN when Joe Lieberman was nominated, and I then was interviewed in, on a, several hundred radio stations uh, over the course of the campaign because I followed his campaign. I was particularly interested in what was happening in the South. Uh, and uh, what happened is that the evangelicals and Pentecostals, which are the fastest growing parts of Christianity in America and in the South, were awed by a Sabbath keeper running for office. Awed. And he, uh, I actually talked with him about this, and he was amazed at the experience as well because, you know, he takes the Shabbat off and uh, in his town and everybody in the town marches behind him to walk to synagogue, and he does that everywhere that he goes. I actually maintain that it was only someone like Gore who had been to uh, uh, divinity School at Vanderbilt, who understood, who understood and understood that the what all the Democrats feared 
that a Jewish candidate, particularly an Orthodox Jewish candidate on the ticket, was a disaster for the uh, ticket. He may have lost the election, but that wasn't the reason why. In fact, the pattern is that, uh, that he was helped. Uh, so, that, so that something has happened to Christianity in the South over this period of time, uh, it's not s as well as to J Judaism itself, and I think it is this growing uh, evangelical dimension of the, uh, of Christian fund and Christian fundamentalism that has made the Jewish situation in the South, oddly, in some ways, uh, a lot easier. It's religion. It's religion itself. If you're religious, you're okay. The rabbis in the South get their own moment on the morning radio broadcasts and so forth. They, they get their, their, their part of it. They hold, typically hold in these towns across the South, uh, a Seder uh, during Passover in which the whole community is invited. Uh, I've talked recently with several rabbis who were head of the Ministerial Association in Louisiana towns. I mean, it's, uh, it's quite extraordinary. And, of course, the feeling for Israel. Do I gather from what you've just said that your answer would be yes to the ancient question that as I was growing up here in New York City, the question always was, great public issues, is it good for the Jews? Mm -hmm. Are you suggesting that Lieberman's nomination campaign was good for the Jews? I think it was overall. For I mean, this reason? For, for, for this reason, number one, and for another reason about which he's been widely criticized by, by people, which is he talked openly about religion as he campaigned, something that Kerry did not do this time and might have been well advised to do, but let's leave that aside. Uh, one of the most interesting things about Lieberman was his openness about religion in the South. And when I try to explain this to others, I say, what was he to do? I mean, here he was as the Jewish candidate, uh, the first uh, ortho religiously Jewish, Orthodox Jewish candidate uh, to uh, run for national office. Uh, I think it was incumbent on him to explain himself so that people would understand. Uh, this was a profound mission to me and watching it. I have a 20-year-old son and I remember calling him uh, when uh, at the night of the Democratic uh, nomination and I'd called him and I said, I want you to really watch this because something uh, profound is really happening, which is that uh, the Democratic Party is, uh, is, he was at college at the time, the Democratic Party is nominating um, a, um, uh, a Orthodox Jew uh, for, for vice president and uh, very openly Jewish. And he said to me on the other end of the phone, Dad, that is really cool, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, I think it had a big impact on Jews as well. There were certainly the point. a lot of Jews who felt contrary was. Very uneasy and it was, ex it was very generational. Uh, in my uh, insight into it. Uh, anyone of, uh, of our generation uh, would have to be uneasy about it, and there certainly was among conventional politicians who had never dealt with an issue like this. I think it would be the same, uh, it was the same when, uh, when the Democratic Party nominated uh, Ferraro, or when, the, uh, or when there was a black elected mayor of uh, Los Angeles and mayor of uh, of, uh, of New York, or when a Catholic was elected president. My father helped run the Kennedy campaign in North Carolina in 60. And uh, they carried it for Kennedy in, in, uh, in 1960, and he was always very uh, proud of that. And one of the reasons was that something, has hap something was asked of religion in America when America was born. Uh, I want to talk about that history because it is very relevant. Tell me what you mean. Um, in I'm going to tell two stories here. One is in Charleston, where there were more Jews in 1800 uh, than there were in any other city in America. And the reason was that um, John Locke had drafted the Constitution as a favor uh, to, to the uh, British. Uh, and John Locke, of course, believed in the natural dignity of man. He was the godfather of jo uh, Thomas Jefferson, the inspiration for the Founding Fathers. So in the, in the Constitution for the city of Charleston, the state of South Carolina, Jews could vote, they could own land, they could leave uh, 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 money uh, to their heirs, they could go in business with Gentiles and non-Jews, they could be in the militia, they could uh, serve in public office. A whole range of questions that was new in history. And um, a message went out. I mean, I've, there's been an exhibition on this. It's been uh, done in Charleston. Uh, uh, news began to trickle out all over the world that something new was happening in America. Because after all, you know, Peter Stuyvesant rejected, tried to reject the early Jewish arrivals in New York, but it was not that case, that, that way in Charleston. So Jews started coming to Charleston. It was the port of entry then because of thermal navigation. You know, you follow your way down through the heat of the waters and measure it with a thermometer and you can find your way to Charleston. 
Uh, later, other navigational tools made it easier to find New York and Boston. But in those days, that was the case. And Charleston grew for another reason, too, uh, that uh, Jews had contacts in Amsterdam and London, uh, in Europe, uh, because there had been this expulsion from uh, Spain uh, in, uh, in 1492, at the same time that America was discovered. And they were needed. They were considered uh, uh, assets to the community. That was new, too. Uh, and so this was a fantasy come true in America. Uh, Jews came to Charleston, were welcomed there. It was a place that flourished Jew Jewishly. And there are other parts of the story as well. Um, and the second part of the story is George Washington and the letter to Turo, which is a really fascinating story because of the context. Washington had been inaugurated uh, at that time, and uh, in New York, by the way, down at uh, down uh, looking over the, what was uh, someday to be the Statue of Liberty Harbor. Uh, and um, uh, he had put on the stage at his inauguration a Catholic, a Jew, and a Protestant minister. And they marched uh, with him after the uh, ceremony. Can, I mean, uh, this is an unheard of idea. There was really very small numbers of Jews at that time in America. Uh, he then went off with Thomas Jefferson to campaign for the Bill of Rights, right on the post-inauguration. And he was in Rhode Island. And Rhode Island was a place that a Jewish community in Turo, a Turo synagogue, had written him complaining that there were certain rights that Jews did not have. And he wrote a letter to the Turo synagogue that's now celebrated every year. Uh, I wrote it down just to make sure I'd get it right. To bigotry, no sanction. The U.S. government of the United States gives to bigotry, no sanction, to persecution, to persecution, no assistance. It went on to say in a lesser celebrated phrase, that tolerance was not something that one class of people gave to another, but was something that everyone deserved as part of the natural rights of man. The natural rights of man was a powerful, powerful element, also from John Locke. So here we have the DNA of the American Revolution. Thomas, Jeff Thomas Jefferson and George Washington campaigning for the First Amendment on religious freedom, separation of church and state, and campaigning against forces of, uh, of bigotry in Rhode Island and writing a letter uh, stating that that was their purpose. But let me pick up what you mentioned about the separation of church and state, right. because I was so much impressed a long time ago in, in reading the provincials when uh, you write about this episode in the early 1940s when um, an American Jewish historian, Jacob Marcus, came to look at the um, private archives of a collector of Judaica in New York, A.S.W. Rosenbach, when he asked, and I think this is such a wonderful story, because you're such a wonderful storyteller, <laughs> when he asked if Rosenbach had any papers of significance to the Jews, Marcus was taken into a vault where Rosenbach pointed to an old yellowing document that had fallen to the floor. This is the most important Jewish document I own. And he picked it up, and what was it? It was the Bill of Rights. It was an original copy of the Bill of Rights that was circulated during that campaign. Okay, but the question that occurs to me, because you go further in that page, uh, referring to Jonathan Sarno of Brandeis University, who had written how Jews have flourished in a free and pluralistic society where church and state are separated and where religion is entirely voluntary. That, in fact, is why I ask you the first question that I ask you about how goes it today when the notion of separation of church and state is fighting what seems to many people a losing battle? Well, it's, we know that freedom doesn't come easy and that it's an ever vigilant battle. Um, I don't know that these issues have really been put in a pure form to the American people in an election. You know, the Iraqi war, um, was a, uh, uh, was, a, was a kind of an issue that, uh, that brought up uh, uh, questions beyond domestic uh, issues. It really focused everyone's mind, and, uh, and possibly rightfully so. I, I've often said that the Republican Party makes a mistake in thinking that this election victory was a, uh, a mandate uh, to do all of the things that they now feel that they are free to do. Because there were so many issues in this election, and a wartime president won an election. That's not a, such a big surprise. But I'll, I'm not talking about social security. I'm not talking about environmental matters. I'm not talking matters. about that either. I am talking about I'm talking religion. About, I'm talking about the, 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 I am concerned, as any American should be concerned, 
about the uh, s separation of, ch of church and state issues and all of the questions that are now, um, uh, I think, coming to the forefront uh, in America. Uh, these are complicated issues, uh, but looking at it from uh, a Southern Jewish point of view, mm -hmm. um, Jews, uh, I, as I said, have always represented the other from the very beginning and demanded of the, the society. They didn't demand it, but the society gave a kind of pluralistic uh, uh, response. Uh, it always did. There are, of course, many people who have written excessively about anti-Semitism in the South. The, uh, the synagogue bombings and so forth in uh, Birmingham and in, uh, uh, and in Atlanta, et cetera, the, the Leo Frank case, et cetera. But that's not really the story of Jews in the South. The story of Jews in the South is in this plotting uh, everyday story of hardworking immigrants uh, who found a place in America and who were welcomed in these communities and began this part of this southern, special southern Jewish consciousness to be a part of their community. Across the South, you see it everywhere. They had the museum boards, they had the libraries, they worked for the public schools, they worked for all the nonprofit organizations because they know instinctively that a better, better community for everyone is a better community for them. Yet you would still say and write, I would imagine, that by and large, breaking the wall between church and state is not good for the Jews. It is not good for the Jews, and it comes up in many different uh, contexts. People, many people have asked me, well, what, what do you have against the uh, Ten Commandments being in every courthouse and on every lawn? And you know, the answer to that is that we have the Ten Commandments over the ark in every synagogue. Uh, but when it begins to get out into the public square, it starts to make people uneasy. Because we know uh, that this excessive religiosity is one in which Jews will not uh, fare well. And uh, this has been uh, a, a sort of right at the center of the Jewish uh, belief and is one in which uh, we're going to have to be a, a continued voice. Uh, no, don't you voice. have to explain that, though, because when you talk about those uh, farmers who visited your grandfather yeah. to find out the alcoholic content of biblical wine, blessing wine, uh, there was that connection. Yeah. And why is it not acceptable today? Well, you know, it still happens, Dick. I mean, I just talked to a, a man in eastern North Carolina. I was mentioning him, didn't finish the story. He, you know, sharecroppers take crops when things are barren. When the crops come in, they pay the store owner. They buy the feed, they buy the seeds, they buy the implements. The farmer comes to town on Yom Kippur to pay this man in eastern North Carolina, and he says he cannot accept the money. He said, it's the only day that I'm going to be here. And he said, I cannot accept money on Yom Kippur. So uh, uh, puzzled, the man leaves knowing that he has to come back. This story spreads in the community, and suddenly people begin to shop there because they've heard that there's a holy man in town. And um, he tells this story with great uh, relish. Jews in these towns support my father, gave money to all the churches in town to the black community uh, because uh, he knew that uh, the Jew non-Jewish community would judge all the Jewish community uh, by the few Jews that they knew. And I was raised with that in school e uh, as well. I'm getting back to, to, to answer the question. I think, that, uh, I think that in a way one of the problems is that uh, A, television has taken over so that the voices of uh, extremism are the are dominant voices in the society. One of the things that has really puzzled me is where the moderate Protestant community uh, spokesmen have been in the middle of all this. They um, say and speak, but they don't seem to be heard. Moderation is not as uh, exciting, uh, um, and that's a problem for our country, not just a problem uh, in this issue. It's a problem on every issue. Uh, but I think one of the things that I learned in growing up with uh, the uh, Christian community is that, that uh, there are reasonable people. Uh, they make judgments of people as they are. Jews and, uh, and Christians in these small towns are, have been uh, close in terms of uh, many of the questions that they had to face. My father was reelected uh, uh, six times, sir, for 12 years, and many, many Jews were elected to public office in the South. And, and it really was the same, in a way, the same pattern of working for your community, uh, maturing uh, into a public uh, uh, person, and uh, being asked to run for office in town after town across the South. As a storyteller, you tell stories of holy men. You called that man you were telling right. this story about who couldn't accept uh, pay. 
on a high holy day, a holy man, are there fewer and fewer or more and more holy men among America's Jews? Well, I think that we're, be we're becoming suburbanized like every other part of the co country and deeply affected by uh, media uh, as every other part of the country is. The truth is the South has changed dramatically for these same reasons too. Reason number one was the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. There were uh, something like 47 black elected official in 19, officials in 1965. There are now 3,900, something like that. Uh, the emergence of the black vote has, uh, you know, pr pr it uh, actually uh, gave the country two moderate governors who were elected to uh, President Clinton and uh, Carter. Uh, and has changed the South's uh, politics, I think, profoundly. Um, even Strom Thurmond uh, had blacks on his staff and, uh, and was a much more moderate figure later in life than he was in the beginning. But, the Jews but back to your uh, question, back to your question, back to your question. Uh, yes, the, the community is changing, but there are just so many different uh, 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 ideas swirling around the Jewish community. There's a renaissance going on. There's a, uh, there's a, a kind of new spirit uh, 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 going on uh, among Jews in the South, among young people in the South. At the same time, there's greater and greater intermarriage. I don't know where this is going to come out, but it's going to be an exciting century for Jews, I think. Do you think at the end, more holy men? I'm not sure more holy men, but uh, I think uh, uh, there will be more and more people who... American jury and American life ask for restraint on all elements of these religions. They did from the very beginning. Catholicism has been changed and Protestantism has been changed, and Jews have been changed too. Eli Evans, I thank you so much for joining me today and recommend again the reading of The Provincials, a personal history of Jews in the South. Uh, a rather extraordinary book, and I understand why you're considered such a wonderful storyteller. <laughs> thanks <laughs> for joining me. Thanks for inviting me. And thanks too to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. And if you would like a transcript of today's program, Please send $4 in check or money order to The Open Mind, P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. For nearly a half century now, our purpose here has been to provide the light of reasoned discourse rather than the heat of verbal battle. That surfaces clearly in As They Saw It, the new paperback collection of conversations from the open mind with a foreword by Mario Cuomo and with memorable words from Martin Luther King, Jonas Salk, Betty Friedan, Malcolm X, Bill Moyers, Rudolph Giuliani, Norman Mailer, and dozens more. Read the book. I think you'll like it.